Hello everybody, I'm Alexandra Making of Early Medieval Embroidery and today we're looking at the embroidery stitches used to recreate this section of the Cuthbert Manipal, which is part of the Cuthbert Manipal recreation project. In the two previous posts, I've talked about the background of the project and a little bit about what the Manipal is and why the Cuthbert one is so important. Um, and I'll put a link to that one down below. And then in the second post, I discussed um, the materials and the process and the collaborative projects that were involved in getting the right materials for the project that were authentic to the original ones as possible. Um, and I've put the link to that post down below as well. So in this post, we're concentrating on the stitches themselves. There were four different types of stitches used. The figure and all the foliage were worked in um, split stitch and outlined in stem stitch. And then the background and the halo of the figure were worked in surface couching using two different patterns, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then the, out, the gold outlines that you can see on the figure were worked in what has been called tracery stitch. Um, this is the only reference to tracery stitch that I've found. I've not found it in any um, encyclopedias of um, embroidery stitches, um, and I've not been able to trace um, the etymology of the name at all. The embroidery stitches were analysed, um, as I mentioned in the first post, by Christie. Um, this was done in 1918 um, and then they were reanalysed by Elizabeth Plenderleith um, in her analysis and that was published in the huge Batiscoon volume with detailed drawings, um, and which you can see here. So with that information, that's how I proceeded with the stitching. So if we look at the silk work, um, the filling was worked first, the split stitch, and each stitch is approximately one millimetre, well not approximately, it is one millimetre um, in length. When I started working this, um, I started with this leaf at the top, and you can see this in detail, um, and my stitch lengths were around about 1.9, uh, 1.3 to 1.9 millimetres in length, which I didn't think was too bad for the starting point. Um, by the time I finished, particularly when we were working around the face and the hands, I had got it down to 1 millimetre to 1.2 millimetres, which I think is quite good going. I worked the um, embroidery in lengths of 40 centimetres. Um, that's because I found that length of thread uh, easier to work um, and it didn't start fraying or um, bobbling um, and which meant that I was able to use practically the whole length of thread um, therefore not wasting as much as perhaps you would if you used longer length and the thread started to bobble or fray during the working process. The, um, the split stitch was worked in, as I say, a single strand of the silk. This is untwisted um, and the thread lay beautifully um, as it was worked. Um, it split nicely as well um, and it was um, obvious that the original embroiderers um, had thought about the mechanisms of the working process and how the threads and the fibres that make the threads up would work when they were creating these stitches um, to create the finished effect on the design. The second stitch I then worked was the outlines, um, which were all worked in this gorgeous, gorgeous brown. And on the close-up, you can see that, um, as I said in post two, these have been hand-dyed using natural dyes and you can see the, ver the slight variation in um, tone in the thread and um, that created a lovely effect when um, stitching these outlines. The, in Plenderleith's report um, and on the back of Christie's work, 
they had assumed that the stem stitch outlines were worked in a thicker thread to the fillings. But when I was working samples, um, oh, and the outline threads were only slightly um, twisted. Um, but when I was working the samples, I found that in order to get the right ratio of thickness um, and also the right, um, what they call twist to the thread, um, it was actually just using two strands of the brown silk. Um, and to, in order to get the right, um, obviously ply, because you're plying two threads together, you're not twisting one thread. Um, you were, I was able to do that during the working process um, and that created the right um, or a similar um, ply um, to what was counted in the original piece. So again, another pro interesting um, conclusion that perhaps um, you wouldn't have um, known about or come across unless you were recreating um, the embroidery. Um, if these um, stitches are also approximately one millimetre in length as well. Um, and by slightly plying this thread, it made the thread more structured when working that stitch and that helped produce um, the evenness of the stitch um, and those small stitch lengths. Um, and to work around some quite sharp um, corners and angles when outlining the different um, sections. It also meant that the outlines um, are raised very, very slightly above the split stitch, um, which combined with the dark colour of the thread um, makes those um, more prominent when you're looking at the embroidery so you can see the outlines um, more clearly than perhaps you would if they were worked in a single strand of the thread um, and in a different stitch. So the I haven't added up all the timings or um, the amounts of materials that were used yet um, but the um, and that will come in a later post but um, what I did find was this was the first element that I stitched here this leaf and whilst I was trying to get my uh, mind into um, the right working pattern, kind of working out how the stitches um, lay, the colour combinations and why those were chosen, um, getting my mind into the early medieval embroiderers mindset, so to speak, um, I found that recreating this leaf actually took um, a lot longer than um, when I moved on to the second leaf and I, and I carried on further down. So my pr working process actually quickened up as I, as I went along. So that's the, um, the filling and the outline stitches. Moving on to the gold thread now, as I mentioned in um, the second post, here it is, the gorgeous gold. Um, this is 99% um, pure gold. Uh, the same as the original gold thread and it is um, 0.2 millimetres in diameter again the same size as the original thread which is, and it's absolutely gorgeous to work with. The, um, the background stitching is worked in what we call single bricking and you can see a diagram of this method um, here and the interesting thing about this is that for every thread on the ground fabric, um, there are two gold threads stitched to it, um, which created quite an interesting working process. Um, learning how to um, lay the gold thread um, and to um, manipulate it in order to allow that second gold thread to be placed there. Remember there's um, 120 gold threads to the inch as well, um, which is a huge, a staggering amount. Um, the couching stitches, and um, they're worked in this gorgeous, gorgeous red. And there are 16 couching stitches per inch as well, which is just 
phenomenal really. Um, and when you work that out, that means that there are 1920 calculated stitches to the square inch, which is a bit mind boggling when you think about it. Um, so when I started the process, I was thinking, Eek, that's just crazy. Uh, but the fabric, the ground fabric, which is um, a tabby weave, or sometimes called a plain weave, um, actually, and it is quite an open weave, as you can see in the detail here. And that means that you can um, count the holes and the threads, which means that um, you can work out where each counting stitch should be placed. It's every five holes, and then you can count those down which really, really helped in the process, as you can imagine, and um, made it um, quite a zen-like process to work. Once you get in the zone and in your mindset and you, you've got that rhythm going with the stitching, um, it's it's quite a, that doesn't sound odd, it's quite a relaxing process. Um, so this was worked after the silk fillings and the outlines have been worked. What Plenderleaf noticed in her analysis um, is that on the back of the um, embroidery, she was able to see the back of the embroidery because she was able to take off the backing um, when um, she was analysing the embroideries at the British Museum. Um, but what Plenderleaf noticed is that um, instead of the um, couching stitches lying as they would normally when you do some couching um, they actually the thread actually interlinks on um, the previous work row of work thread on the back um, she was quite intrigued by this as um, I was um, and she worked a sample piece but in much larger threads um, and, and different threads not silk um, and um, she came to the conclusion that this was um, just a coincidence because the because you were stitching two gold threads to one thread of the ground fabric. Um, I didn't disbelieve her, but I wanted to test that theory using the authentic materials. And you can see from the um, microscopic image I've taken of the back of my work that she's right. Um, the interlinking is basically a coincidence with the work, working two gold threads to every um, thread of ground fabric. So the um, halo is also worked in um, surface couching but not in single bricking. The halo is worked in what we call a zigzag um, which you can see a detail of here. The halos on all the figures on both the stole and the maniple um, are either worked in a variation of a lattice or a zigzag or um, a, a variation of double bricking. The other difference is that while the gold thread on the background in, is vertical, the gold thread on the um, halos are all horizontal and so that gives you um, a different effect when light pings off it, um, but also because the couching stitches lie differently, that adds to the like, opulence and the effect, um, the visual effects that are created. I was a little concerned about working the, the zigzag because, um, again, there were two gold threads to the ground to every thread on the ground fabric, um, and it was about getting the angles right um, as well as counting it correctly. There was a lot of unpicking went on. Um, but in the end, I think it worked well, as, and you can see in the detail here that the zigzag effect is visible um, when you look in close up at the, um, the finished piece. So that was really interesting and um, exciting. The final stitch is a tracery stitch, which is the gold thread used for the outlines. Um, and this is the stitch that you can see in the first YouTube post that I um, sent live in the before and after. 
um, which I've put the link to down below. You can see me working that speedy dot. That, um, that short two, two to three snippet is actually 30 minutes of working um, speedy dot. So you can see how long the process took. <laughs> um, so that for, to work the trace we stitch, there are three strands of gold being worked and manipulated at the same time. And um, the both Kenderleaf and Christie, they didn't really go into much detail into how this was worked, but they did say that the three threads were couched in place, and that by couching them in place, um, the two out the two outer ones, as you can see from the detail, um, were brought inwards underneath the middle one every so often, and it created a chain-like effect. When I first started working the trace stitch at the bottom here, and you can see from the image, um, it, the process that I used, which was basically couching the three threads in place, um, as you would normally for surface couching, didn't create the right effect. So um, I had to go back to the drawing board. And eventually I discovered that to create that beautiful um, chain effect, you had to couch the two outer threads at the same time using one stitch that was placed in the middle and then the middle thread would be um, couched in place just below it um, which would push the two outer threads out slightly creating that beautiful curve um, and then they would be gathered back in again with the next couching stitch which lay underneath the middle thread that had been placed over the top and you can see this in the snippet that's being shown here. Um, so again another interesting process um, that um, I've never seen or read of before um, and I've actually never come across that stitch being used on, on other pieces of early medieval embroidery. I've not had a chance yet to look at any Opus Agricanum um, later embroidery, but I will do to see if it was used there. Um, <clears throat> in order to keep the three threads from tangling, I used a Japanese korma. Which you can see here, this is still attached to the main gold thread, but you can see it here. Um, and so I wrapped um, measured lengths, because obviously I was measuring how much thread I was using, around the korma, um, and then I had three of them. And as long as you kept the threads in the correct positions for working, the um, kormas actually um, did the job perfectly. It held the thread straight, not tangling and you were able to move and manipulate the gold thread quite easily. We have no evidence for that sort of thing in um, early medieval England um, and what I plan to do in the future is go through some um, archaeological excavation reports and look at the miscellaneous finds section to see if I can find anything that could have been used might be similar um, for that sort of thing. Plunging the ends of the gold thread, those of you who've worked um, gold embroidery know that today, um, particularly with um, thicker threads, you, you have to make a hole in the silk fabric um, and then you have to, using a larger needle, thread um, some strong thread through it, take the larger needle through and then use the loop of the strong thread to pull the gold thread through to the back. None of that for this. Yes, I have to find, say I find that a bit tedious. The gold thread is so fine and the ground fabric, um, the weave is so um, open with that gauze-like effect that I was able to actually thread um, the gold thread through um, a larger needle and I was able to just what, take, plunge the gold thread to the back of the fabric in that manner. Um, so much um, easier and then on the back um, as you can see the detail here um, I didn't need to over sew the gold threads in place as we would do today I was just able to pass the gold threads under previous sections of sewing 
um, as you would when you're working silk threads, wool threads, whatever, um, and they are anchored in place that way. Whether that's how they were anchored in place on the original or not, we obviously don't know. Um, I am hoping to go down to the British Museum and look at their archive, the photographs at some point. So hopefully there were images taken of the back um, during the cleaning process and I can see um, how the gold threads were anchored then. But again, that will be a future post. Um, so yes, yeah, so that really um, helped in um, the process. It, it made the process a lot faster and a lot less tedious as well. Um, so that's a brief run through of the stitches um, and how they will work for the project. If you've got any questions you would like to ask about that, and I'm sure some people will have, then please put it in the comments below and I will try and answer them as best I can. Um, if you've got any, uh, if you would like to know anything in particular about the project that I've not covered so far, then again put that in the comments below and I will aim to um, work a post around that as well. And thank you very much for listening. Bye!